Public Accounts Committee is a novelty. What is the game plan? What do you hope to achieve with this whole novelty since this is the first time that um, the ECOWAS Parliament is going to have a committee like this to deal with issues of um, finance? Public Accounts Committee is going to lay the foundation for accountability and transparency. Every, every parliament, everywhere, you find out that they are the, they serve as a neutral people, the transparency group. So where in audit reports, the national audit reports are sent to parliament, the public accounts committee will look at those reports and if there are gray areas, those areas will be looked into where uh, in fact, the committee find out that there is suspected corruption. That committee can make recommendations that will more or less bring the perpetrators to justice. And the important thing about Public Accounts Committee is that it also actually acts as a basis on which the public will begin to see value for their money in the various institutions. If, for example, like I said in my speech, if governments, ECOWAS, states, and governments have to be accountable to the people or to donor partners, it has to start with ourselves. Parliament, our parliament, the ECOWAS parliament, have to be accountable. And my plan is to use this particular committee to ensure that there is accountability and transparency. So yes, it's going to create a lot of impact. I've already had kudos from yesterday. People have been calling me that they believe this is the right time. If we are talking about corruption, we are talking about transparency, this is the right time to bring in the Public Accounts Committee, which means from now onwards, once we have the approval of the Council of Heads of States, from now onwards, all audit reports will be brought to the ECOWAS Parliament and we'll have public hearings on all of the issues that the public uh, reports brings up. Public hearing, where all of you, especially NTA, will be there to see what is actually happening with the people's money. So that's, the reason, that's, one, thing, that's one reason why I've decided to bring in the Public Accounts Committee. Issues to do with gender. We see lip service being paid. What are you doing as a speaker in the fifth legislature? On the issue of the Bureau, we've always stated that we have must have uh, 30%. And in this particular case, one female MP in the Bureau doesn't add up. It adds up to about 20%. So we believe that in future, going forward, probably we will have to come up with rules that will more or less confirm and affirm gender participation in politics. One of the key areas that I am really looking at is to ensure that I empower women's groups and networks across the ECOWAS region so that they will be able to participate in politics because at the end of the day, everybody is talking about affirmative action in our national parliaments, where we give women 30% quota in governance, will be it in uh, the executive or the legislature or the MDAs, the, that is uh, the departments and agencies. But there has to be a starting point. Yes, I was really, really disappointed when I saw the Nigerian delegation. But again, uh, I understand few of them did not come. So it's very, very possible those that did not come are women. So let us hope that those MPs who did show up yesterday from uh, Nigeria, from the Nigerian delegation, are actually female parliamentarians. If not, I would definitely be disappointed myself. Because with a delegation of 35, one would expect that you have at least up to about 10 female members of parliament. But what I saw yesterday was just two. And almost all other delegations that have women, there are one or two women. 
they came. Sierra Leone, we have a woman in our delegation, a female parliamentarian. We retain her. Ghana, same. And uh, Gambia, same. So I would have expected that our big brother, Nigeria, would have done a little bit more to bring in female participation in politics. And that is one area I'm really, really looking at to ensure that we have female participation in politics. And not just politics, but all mediation efforts. If we're talking about peacemaking, peace building, women play a very important role in all of these things. I will try my level best to ensure that I have female participation in all of what I will be doing. We hope to see that during your tenure, sir. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. You, you won novelty, like you talked about earlier, that is the Public Accounts Committee. So what else uh, should the community look to that your tenor will be doing differently from the others? You see, the problem we have in a sub-region, and for which the parliament is key in solving, are the political issues, governance issues, democracy. The people in the commission are all technocrats. They are not politicians. The people in the courts are technocrats. These are lawyers. They don't know anything about politics. It is a parliament. It's the parliament. We, the politicians in parliament, we should take leadership in all of these mediation efforts. We have the situation, for example, right now in Guinea. There is even what the commission can do about it. But these are our colleagues, our, our, our colleagues parliamentarians in Guinea or in Guinea-Bissau and in other countries that have issues, or Cote d'Ivoire. So we, we are in a better position to actually engage our counterparts, our colleagues in other countries. So my plan is to engage more so that we we'll uphold democracy, we we'll uphold uh, fair play, and that's why I said it in my speech, that we we'll deploy long-term observers who will actually engage the incumbent governments and the opposition to ensure that we have free and fair elections across the board. And for those of our brothers who may be thinking of overstaying, we are in a better position to also engage them as politicians to look at the possibility of bringing them on board to ensure that we actually don't just talk about democracy, but we'll actually practice it. I believe Parliament is in a better position to do so. There's this other agitation from uh, members of Parliament. When would we have direct election into, um, let's say, the Sith legislature? The community Parliament is a community Parliament. As it is right now, we have uh, dual functions. Uh, for example, I am the leader, the majority leader in my Parliament in Sierra Leone. Now I'm Speaker of ECOWAS Parliament. What I intend to do is to engage the Commission, the Council of Ministers, and of course the Council, uh, Authority of Heads of States. I want to initiate studies. This particular uh, fifth parliamentary term, fifth legislature, I want to initiate studies where we we'll actually look at the possibility of direct elections into the fifth legislature, into the sixth legislature, or into the ECOWAS parliament. That way, MPs will be committed. Take for example, as we speak, I'm already under pressure to cut short. If you look at my program, it's for, it's for five days, up to Friday. But because of already the pressure I'm having from some MPs who have engagement in their national parliaments, I'm looking at the possibility of cutting it down to, to Thursday. And if it may be Wednesday, just to allow them to go and engage, do whatever they are going to be doing in their national parliament. That is definitely going to hurt the ECOWAS parliament. That kind of situation is going to hurt the ECOWAS parliament. My plan, uh, before I leave Niger, I'm meeting with the president of uh, Niger, who is chairman of the authority of heads of states and government, and I intend to engage him begin to discuss the possibility of doing this study. And once I have the go-ahead from him, I will now talk to my administration to begin to give me a format as to how we'll even start the studies. But I'm very determined that we'll do it under my leadership. We are going to do it 
so that by the time we're talking about the sixth legislature, we will not be talking about direct uh, elections into the ECOWAS parliament. Again, ECOWAS parliament should have a place it can call its place where we have the ECOWAS uh, parliament because now as we speak, uh, ECOWAS parliament is living at the benevolence of uh, the Nigerian government. We have to live at the benevolent of the Nigerian government. They are the big brother. As a matter of fact, I must say thanks to His Excellency President Muhammadu Buhari and the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who have actually agreed to help to construct a new parliament for, for the ECOWAS parliament. I actually don't know the details, but I know some funds have actually been made available already by the federal government, but I don't know how far they have come with that. But my plan is to set up an ad hoc committee as soon as I get to Abuja. I'm going to have a bureau meeting and I will set up the ad hoc committee, put somebody in charge so to actually engage the federal government. And I can assure you that this 2020, we're going to launch that project by the help of God. Your Excellency, um, you did talk about COVID-19 in your speech. And, um, you know, as it threatens the economies of the world, what efforts as a parliament would you be taking to ensure that should such a disease ravage the world again, ECOWAS and the sub-region is uh, actually prepared and not taking unawares, as I would say, the region was taking unawares this time. You see, we already have an experience with Ebola before where at least three countries were ravaged by the virus, the Ebola virus. We have a West Africa Health Organization, WAHO, that as parliament, I believe we should engage a little bit more you know, because all, we have all of these institutions. It's, you know, it's just like in our various countries. We have the laws, but how do we implement them? Have always been a problem. So my plan is uh, on the health sector to actually engage WAHO and ensure that we do a little bit more of engagement with them so that at the end of the day, we, the parliamentarians, will be in a position to, like go back to our respective countries with a uniform message. Because if we are engaging WAHO through the ECOWAS parliament, we will have a uniform message that will take all over West Africa, all of the countries, Portuguese, French, English countries. That way, I believe it will be better that we get all of us on the same page and get, get, getting us better prepared for anything. The issue of visa on arrival, a lot of countries are practicing it already. A lot of countries, including Sierra Leone, my own country. I don't know the, I cannot tell you off head the country, but I know about 20 countries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs through uh, immigration also made a public, public announcement on visa on arrival. You see, as long as we are able to coordinate our activities under one umbrella, which is the ECOWAS Commission, all of the countries of, in the ECOWAS region will be able to work on the same platform. And my plan is to actually use this parliament, ECOWAS parliament, to engage all of these institutions to ensure that when Nigeria, for example, say this is black, Gambia, Kevad will be say this is black because we want to have a uniform message on a lot of issues. Excellency, in the last, uh, last December, during the closing section of the second uh, ordinary summit in Abuja, the, when the president of ECOWAS was presenting his budget, he's presenting his report, he said budget is hampering their implementation. So what will you do to ensure that budget is in pass as big follow-up? Unlike what he said that they, uh, as at September, only 20% has been released to them. Now, what will you do differently? You see, budgets everywhere 
um, uh, presumptions. You don't have the cash on you when you make your budget. You make your plans to say that you're going to, let's say, uh, visit the Sahel 10 times in a year. You made a budget for it. But then, at the time you are making that budget, you really do not have the resources. You are assuming that you will get those resources. The major problem which I believe we should address is community levy. How do we com uh, prevail on our brothers and sisters in the respective countries to ensure that they pay their community level. But community levy is not anybody's money. You are collecting it on behalf of the commission. So if you collect it, just pass it. You should only be used as a conduit. So we'll be, we'll be, look at, we'll be working with the commission. That's what I said in my speech. We're going to collaborate more with the commission. So that at the end of the day, countries like Kevat they are missing out on a lot of uh, positions because they are not paying their levy. They are not. That's what at least we are told. But as a parliament, we will begin to engage them. For example, I have a meeting with the delegation from Kevat. I want to look at the possibility of even sending maybe the chairman of the finance committee in consultation with the commission to Kevat. Because I really want us to ensure that we collect the community levy. Because without the levy, there is no way our programs are going to be implemented. And if we are in this together, then we should be prepared to pay our levies. Yes, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes they will collect the money and probably use it for something else. But we should make a collective effort to ensure that we pay. So that at the end of the day, we are able, for example, now we have a coronavirus situation. We should have enough resources in our coffers through the levy to immediately deploy professionals across West Africa. Sensitize people. We could deploy MPs, missions across West Africa to make sure that they sensitize our people, work with the local parliaments, you know, move into the constraints because it's about prevention. We should not be talking about what we will do when the, the thing struck. And as it is right now, it, we all know it's just a matter of time. It's already around. It may even be here. We don't know. You see? So community level for me is a key thing in implementing projects. Where does the media come in in all your plans? If you notice, in a whole paragraph that took almost uh, 10 minutes to read, the issue of information and communication I brought to the fore. We cannot be talking about a community parliament when the people don't even know about a community parliament. Even in Nigeria, a lot of people don't even know about a community parliament. They don't know. So we must work out a communication strategy where we will bring the ECOWAS parliament to the people, where the people will own their parliament, because this is a community, this is the people's parliament. It's the parliament that belongs to the community. So we must have a strategy where the people will own their parliament, where they will have interest in what is happening in their parliament. So yes, we're going to have a completely different strategy in the way we deal with the media, in the way we communicate with our community people. Definitely it's very, very important. NTA is at your service. NTA has a parliament channel, a channel dedicated to the parliament. Okay, that's very good. Uh, I, I'm very, very happy to meet you. And uh, I believe we will collaborate and cooperate with uh, the media generally in West Africa. I really want a situation wherein when we have a mission, we should be able to ensure that that program will only not be shown in Port Harcourt or in Teba or in Accra or in Ghana or Nigeria. But the entire region is able to benefit from what is happening with ECOWAS Parliament in Tema or in Podakot. That's, that's the kind of strategy I'm looking at. And I hope we'll work together, the media generally in West Africa. 
I really want to have an integrated approach in communications. Thank you very much.